Welcome to the Western Bell podcast series with talks on traditional spiritual teaching and its application in the world today. The intention of the series is to offer something useful for those who are drawn to study themselves and engage practice on the spiritual path. New talks are posted twice each month. The content of the talks is for informational purposes only and not to provide any kind of counseling, medical, or professional advice. This podcast is titled, Kneel and Kiss the Ground, The Poetics of Presence and Purpose. The talk was given by Mary Angelon Young on June 11th, 2022, via Zoom. Angelon is a workshop leader with a background in Jungian psychology. She is an editor and author of As It Is, Under the Punai Tree, The Bowel Tradition, Caught in the Beloved's Petticoats, Enlightened Duality with her teacher, Lee Lozowick, Krishna's Heretic Lovers, and The Art of Contemplation. If there is benefit in this talk for you, please consider sharing the link to it or writing a review on social media or on one of the podcast platforms. Angelon Young. Welcome, everybody. Thank you for coming this evening in this brief moment of communitas together on Zoom which has been kind of an amazing revelation these last two years that actually wonderful things could happen on Zoom. So I welcome you, and I'm so happy that you're here. And the title of this talk is Kneel and Kiss the Ground from the poem by Rumi. And I'll begin by reading the poem. Today, like every other day, we wake up empty and frightened. Don't open the door to the study and begin reading. Take down a musical instrument. Let the beauty we love be what we do. There are hundreds of ways to kneel and kiss the ground. So I'm going to take this poem like a shloka, like line by line, and explore a little with you what Rumi is giving to us and what's the teaching here, because of course all of his Poems are great teachings. So we begin with the first line. Today, like every other day, we wake up empty and frightened. That may not be your exact experience. Maybe you don't wake up empty and frightened every day. And maybe you only experience being frightened every now and then or feeling the fear that's free-floating in the world, the tsunami of fear that's going on in the world. But nonetheless, this line relates, everyone has a place where we can relate to it, to feeling alone, empty, frightened, feeling anxiety, grief. So the events in the world today, they're like a steady diet of suffering and delusion, misery, trauma, war, heartbreak, toxic poison of all kind. So these feelings, fear, anxiety, and grief are natural responses to the reality of the world as it is, not the world as it should be or that we wish that it would be, but as it is. The world is full of poison. It's also full of nectar, and we're going to explore both of those a little this evening. We find ourselves at the crossroads, don't we? We don't know what's going to happen. Of course, it's always been the unknown throughout human history, but now we're at a whole different kind of crossroads. It's a liminal place, and it requires us to be very fluid and have a certain ability to shape shift in the midst of everything that's going on and the unknown of what the future holds. So in contemplating the teaching of this poem, The way I see it is there are three ways that we can work with the poison of today's world, with the fact that today, like every other day, we wake up empty and frightened. Three ways that we can work with that. The first one is to just reject it, to refuse to sit at the table of the feast of this life, good and bad, beautiful and terrible. We can do that by strictly choosing a vertical path of transcendence through our spiritual practice. And of course, many of us have experienced firsthand personally that doing that leads to bigger problems of spiritual bypass. 
I was thinking about how years ago, my teacher, Lee Lozowick, during the period of time on our ashram and for all of his students, our practice included an extremely austere dietary discipline. So we were literally eating salads and maybe some steamed vegetables and some quinoa and brown rice. And that was basically our diet on the ashram. But every now and then, and actually fairly often, Lee would take us out and we would have hamburgers, we would have pizza, we would have Coca-Cola, we would be eating street food, we'd be eating junk food. And certainly in traveling with him, there was plenty of that. And I remember him saying once, he was talking about the practice of a strict diet, a strict vegetarian diet. And he said that we engage that practice because it's the most useful way to nourish the body because the food is digestible and it digests very quickly so that our energy is freed up for other work, for inner work, for meditation, for contemplation, for inquiry, for working within ourselves. And he said that if our diets became too pure, that we would actually endanger ourselves, that we could become weakened in a way because we become rigid in that purity and rigid in that practice. And so he wanted us to be able to shape shift and build a certain kind of strength to be able to digest foods that we might normally consider toxic, not good for us, or even poisonous. So when we start looking at rejecting things, we can actually, and we are in fact, weakening ourselves because we need a little bit of the dose of the poison of this world. And I'm going to come back to that. So rejection of what is out in the world. And and by this, I mean, including We don't want to hear, we don't want to know what's going on. We don't want anybody to even talk about what's going on, whether it's the war in Ukraine or mass killings or whatever it is that's really terrible and toxic in many ways and heartbreaking. We don't even want to hear about it. So that's one way, reject it all. Just go straight up into purity, into oneness, escape this world. The next possibility is we fully identify with it. We can go all the way into hedonism. We can, through excess, by just taking everything on indiscriminately, actually, that's another form of escapism, just like rejection can be a form of escapism. So in this case, when we fully identify and we don't bring any discrimination to bear in what we're doing, we just take everything. We gorge and stuff ourselves on every type of substance, impression, or literal food that comes our way. So news, internet, movies, Instagram, which I personally am on. I'm not making a a statement against Instagram. I'm talking about doing too much of it, being on it too much and too long. Books, articles, podcasts, gossip, drama obsessing over negative images, feeding ourselves too much of this, allowing our minds to just go on and on in what's called pathological rumination. So this kind of gorging on everything, of course, we're going to get sick from doing that too. It's like a Roman orgy. We get sick, we get lost. And then there's a third possibility, and that's the middle path, which is actually a tantric path. And whether those of you who are listening either tonight on Zoom or later listening to this as a podcast, whether you have practiced Tantra throughout your life or had any direct experience of it in your spiritual practice or with a teacher, or you've heard a lot about it, Tantra has become a part of our culture and a common term that's, of course, misunderstood. But Tantra is, in this case where we're looking at ways that we can relate with reality and with waking up empty and frightened because of the conditions in the world. We find that Tantra can be and is a razor's edge that leads us in between those other two options of rejection or full-on identification with it. Like this saying from uh, the uh, Agori sage Vimalananda, you want to live with reality 
because reality will come to live with you. So we do want to be able to partake in healthy doses of what is going on in the feast of reality through our discernment. How much do we take in? Do we take in small amounts like a chutney or a salsa? If you have a big plate of Indian food, you have a little bit of chutney, which has lots of spices and hot chilies and garlic and onions and all kinds of things like that. And, and if you just ate that, you would have a very big problem in your digestive tract. But if you just eat a little of it, it adds a texture and flavor and spice and a necessary ingredient, actually, to the overall diet. So I'm speaking metaphorically now and literally, too, of course. But it's a great metaphor. So in small amounts, like chutney or hot salsa, um, maybe a homeopathic dose for some of us. Maybe that's all it should be for some of us. Because this thing of the tantric path and the middle road in between excess and rejection, this is very individual. There isn't a recipe or a formula for this. We all have to come to our own deep understanding and knowing of what works for us. It's different for everybody. I love this image of the Sanskrit word marga. It's the word that is used to refer to the spiritual path. It means path. And the ancient rishis use this word. The root word is a deer, D-E-E-R. Because the way a deer meanders through a forest is the way the spiritual path is. And that's what we're looking at with tantra. We're approaching it from an individual basis, even though there are universal principles involved. I was trained back in another lifetime as a psychotherapist in the Jungian model. And so I really love to bring the wisdom of C.G. Jung into my talks and workshops and writing and so on. So I've recently been really interested in his teaching, which comes from the Red Book. That's his personal journal and his personal writings about his own deep process of working with himself alchemically and his inner work, his inner yoga. And he used this phrase, the spirit of the depths and the spirit of the times. You know, he was very clear in saying human beings, unlike animals, are made up of pairs of opposites. So the spirit of the times and the spirit of the depths, these are two essential ways that we can understand what is going on for us. How am I relating with the spirit of the times, which may be causing me to wake up empty and frightened? Well, it's a call to go to the spirit of the depths. Just a little bit more on the Jungian perspective on this. It is actually when we are able and willing to consciously hold the tension of the opposites. And those of you who have been to my talks have heard me say this before. But we can't hear, I cannot hear it too much. We can't hear it too many times. We hold the tension between the spirit of the times and the spirit of the depths. And the more we do that, an alchemical process is activated. We do it by paying attention. And as we hold the tension between those opposites, our being is grown, stretched, expanded, capable of greater consciousness and capable of participating in the evolutionary process of life. So here's a quote from Lee. This is Lee Lazowick. My teaching is intentionally obscure, masked in a lot of stories, jokes, and strange behavior. I want people to dig for it, and if it means enough to you, you will. And if you do dig for it, you will find it. How do you get the signs as to where to look? Pay attention. Look at what the dynamics of the space are. The teaching is here and accessible all the time. But certain spaces seem to be more potent, more highly charged than others. There seems to be a greater possibility. We feel closer to breakthrough. So pay attention. It's like a child's treasure hunt. You have to go one clue at a time. I mean, he's giving this teaching in 1998. And of course, he's talking about being in spaces with him where the presence of reality is very, very strong and very potent. He is no longer in his body. Lee died almost 12 years ago. But 
everything that he gave and that he talked about in his teaching, and this being an example of that, is still present here and now because it's universal, it's ubiquitous, it's life. Life itself is doing this. So how do we know when we're on that meandering road, we're one of the deer on the meandering road, how do we know which course to take? We pay attention and we begin to build the substance of our presence through the practice of presence. All of the meanderings on the path throughout all of the years, lots of unexpected things arise. So how do we know when to take the shortcut or the side road that appears just suddenly, unexpectedly over there? Or when we should just stay on course and plot along? How do we know when to eat the whole sandwich or to only eat half of the sandwich because we've had enough? I'm using these as metaphors for being able to make these kinds of discernments on the tantric path, the middle path in which we don't reject life. We participate in it, but we participate with awareness, with presence. So the more we cultivate awareness and practice being present with reality as it is, the greater our capacity for life. And the very practice of presence cultivates more presence. And the more we do that, the more we ourselves become like a healing balm for the world just by being, just by being present. So the second line of the poem, he says, don't open the door to the study and begin reading. So what does Rumi mean by this? For me, Rumi means that it's not going to work to rely on the rational mind. It's not going to get us through the night, much less have us singing and dancing. How are we singing and dance in difficult times, in times when the whole world is falling apart and unraveling around us? How do we keep singing and dancing? Another metaphor. I'm a big lover of twilight language, so I'll be using a lot of it. Of course, we need the rational linear mind. It never works to throw something out, but to use it wisely. So the linear rational mind has helped us to clarify things. It's taught us all kinds of things. It's helped us to define, identify, and articulate what we value, what our purpose and path are, to help us make aims in our spiritual life and on the path. It helps us make distinctions, to plan, to understand how we got to where we are now, to have perspective. It's very important. It's essential to study scripture. So Rumi is saying, don't start reading and taking the scripture up. Don't start reading. He doesn't mean don't study the scripture because, of course, we need the scripture so that we can understand the truth of our own experience in relationship to the wisdom of others and the wisdom of tradition, what has happened over eons of time. But there is a time to leave Scripture alone and to stop studying. As Jesus said, the kingdom of heaven is within you. So especially when we are gripped by the spirit of the times, We're in the grips of a fear of a highly uncertain future, all that is unknown, the anxiety that we have for our children and grandchildren, the conditions of the world, the war, the pandemic, et cetera, et cetera. We need to take a different approach. We need to access the spirit of the depths, the origins of our true nature, the origins of the deep self. So this calls us to the third line, take down a musical instrument. Now here, the poet has given us an entirely new metaphor that speaks directly to us about creativity, imagination, and even revelation. A musical instrument requires a lot of skill, which is implied and hinted at in the line before that. Because clearly we've already opened the door to the study. We've already done that. The poet is already, without saying it, 
he has acknowledged that we've already done that. So the metaphor of this line flows very easily, and it goes in the direction with connecting with our true nature, the place where we can work with both poison and nectar. Here's another quote from Lee Lozowick. Revelation is when something has been revealed to you as it is in your body as a bodily experience, and you know that it is right. Life is paradoxical, and the paradox is about the intersection of two different planes of reality, the intersection of two different planes of reality. So, here again, we can take a look at what's the intersection between the spirit of the depths and the spirit of the times, the in-between place, the place from which all of the planes arise. So that leads us to what choices can we make to help us out. To line four, let the beauty you love be what you do. I want to go into a, a part of my talk tonight, which is an exploration, but also a shout of joy and happiness about the fact of wonder, because we're going to go into what wonder is. Let the beauty you love be what you do. So being open to beauty in all the forms of life primes the pump of our wonder and awe. So wonder is really important to us. Wonder dissolves our crystallizations, it expands us, it opens the heart, it opens the mind, it breaks down concepts. Concepts don't mean very much when we're in a state of wonder. Wonder makes us bigger, it stretches us, forces us to grow in a way, although there's very little force involved. And Wonder creates a very specific chemical environment in the body, a very positive environment. It triggers the release of dopamine, and it puts us in a very receptive chemical state in the body so that the body is ready for something. It's ready to experience the unknown. So I've so much enjoyed the work of this man. His name is Jeffrey Davis and his little book, Tracking Wonder, Reclaiming a Life of Meaning and Possibility in a World Obsessed with Productivity. I would say in a world obsessed with greed and war and power and you know, a whole bunch of other things, not just productivity. But I love the book. So I'm going to basically riff on his six qualities of wonder that we can begin to pay attention to and be aware of. We're going to study these for a minute. We're just going to take the book down and study it for just a minute, even though when real wonder strikes us, when we're seized or grabbed by wonder, it is so far beyond studying the book. But here's something useful. So let's play with this a little bit. The six qualities of wonder, I like to think of them also as connected to bhavas, like states of being, feeling states. The first one is openness. It's about having a big mind. A big heart, open, open mind, open heart, open eyes. And this is really a way of life. Once we begin to taste the nectar of what being open can bring to us, it becomes a way of living. The second one, curiosity. I love this one because I've been a rebel my entire life, going back to being a teenager. And I'm still a rebel and still have a rebellious spirit. But it's also curiosity goes very well with this phrase is another teaching from Lee, draw no conclusions mind. You're just curious about it. What is that? It makes us open to something that might have been threatening to us or that we would close down to if we're just simply curious about it. There might be something for me there. There might not, but let's find out. It's a very beautiful, fluid way to be. Curiosity. Keep questioning. Keep questioning and questing and knowing that you are on a journey and the journey is never over. So the third quality of wonder, near and dear to my heart, this one, and it is bewilderment. 
And in bewilderment, I think of it sometimes as forest dwelling taken to a new level because in bewilderment, we are lost in the woods. And we need to be lost in the woods. We need to, at the crossroads, we need to be lost because that's where the healing and the possibility can happen. So ubiquitous human experiences like grief, disorientation, loss, depression, these all fall into this place of bewilderment. And it is a kind of wonder. It's not comfortable, but it's where a lot of real work happens, is allowing ourselves to feel the grief, feel being lost, feel I don't know. And it's scary. I'm going to come back to bewilderment, but let's go on to the fourth quality, the last three. The fourth quality is hope. And this is not about naive hope or sentimentality or nostalgia. This is about something much deeper, something even alchemical. We could think of it as our capacity for ongoing renewal and resilience. We could think of it as a connection to trusting in the process of the universe whatever that is, whatever that brings to us. The next quality of wonder is connection. And I like this word communitas. I heard it referred to in two or three different sort of synchronistic moments where it was brought to my attention. Communitas, and basically, I'll give you a great definition of it. This is from Michael Mead. We are being called to awaken the soul of humanity and reweave the bonds of communitas. Communitas refers to community taken to a deeper level that allows all the people to share a common experience. This shared common experience often has a mystical quality that connects to a sense of human kindness and an openness typically associated with the presence of the divine. So connection is one of the qualities of wonder. And of course, we can experience it in communitas with others, in relationship, through communication, through the messages and signs and synchronicities and symbols that we experience. We can experience connection through nature. We can experience connection looking at the vast spread of the stars in the night sky. So the last quality of wonder that we're going to investigate for just a moment is admiration, which I like to call praise. Being able to admire in other people these beautiful qualities that we see them bringing to the table. Being able to be supported and nurtured and nourished by their qualities, empowering their beautiful qualities. This is admiration. And we get inspired by other people's strengths and their beautiful capacities for life. At another level, we could look at that as praise, praising everything. My Mahaguru Yogi Ram Sarakmar, for many years, he was a mendicant beggar on the streets of India. And he used to say, this beggar wants only praise. And what did he mean by that? It wasn't like an egoic statement, like just praise me. He was talking about our relationship to life, our relationship to divinity, our relationship to the divine, our relationship to nature, our relationship to each other, to our children, to our partners. Okay, so I want to hone in on bewilderment for a moment here because it's very hard for us. We don't like the idea of being bewildered. It's upsetting for most of us. And yet that's where the work begins is when we're bewildered. I've been very much enjoying the work of an African man. His name is Bayo Okomalafe. He's a clinical psychologist. He's a PhD, but he calls himself a recovering academic. He goes around the world giving talks. And he also calls himself a recovering psychologist because after he got his PhD in the Western system, he began to study with his Yoruba elders because he's Nigerian. And so he went to his Yoruba elders, and one of the first things that he learned from them was they said to him, if you want to make sure that the path you're on is the right path, then you have to be willing to get lost. This is bewilderment. 
This is one of the ways we can understand bewilderment. Another thing that he said about the Yoruba elders is that when he began to work with them in healing spaces and sacred healing ritual and the different ways that they were training him, the first thing that he saw was that he witnessed in them and how they were working with people as healers was that they would make things worse. That's the first thing they do. As they make things worse, they poke at the wound, so to speak. It's very interesting because we want our grief and our bewilderment and our rupture to be healed as quick as possible. But Bayo Akumalafe is saying, he's saying, no, be present with our grief. See, I'm going to read a couple of quotes from him. He's talking about the importance of grief and being willing to grieve. And this is very personal and precious for me because I've had a lot of tastes of grief and a lot of long sojourns in the deep well of tears, the pool of tears and sorrows, and taken quite a few deep dives down there over the years, as many of us have who are listening here tonight or to this podcast. Let us honor our grief for a moment with Bayo Okomalafe's words. He says, grief in my world isn't private. It's a public affair. One, because we don't see ourselves as individualized selves that are containers for this private internal feeling that we think of as grief. Grief spills. Grief is ecological. Grief is psychological. It is not so much a private thing that we hold inwards. It's a murmuration. And I'm trying to evoke the waltzing of starlings in the sky, which is called a murmuration. It's a murmuration of bodies, both human and non-human. I have often thought of the opening of plants or the falling of leaves in the fall as a form of grieving. That maybe that's how trees grieve. Maybe the world grieves in ways that we do not know how to name yet. But maybe grief is happening all around us. Maybe we need grief. Maybe we're actually citizens of grief all the time. If we recognize grief as ecological, as a terrain that is existing at the liminal tense edges between humans, If we see grief as part of that liminal space, what would it be like to actually pay attention to it, to actually explore it as a map-making project of finding, locating loss? Because grief comes from a place of loss. That's how we experience it. I actually think about it as something political, as politics, grief as politics. But what if grief is an outcome, not something that we want to move on from? What if staying in that place does the work of reshaping our sensibilities so that we can taste different, see different, think different, embrace each other different? Maybe there's wisdom in staying in that terrain. People come together, have ways of embarking, ways of ritualizing their space together. There's something improvisational about it, and there's always something ancestral about it. But I feel that we could be inventing spaces of grief activism. And he goes on to talk about how much that benefits the world when we're actually willing to grieve. I recently had another big taste of grief when the mass murders happened in a small town in Texas and all the children were killed and the two teachers, 19 children, two teachers. I I know many people who afterwards told me they too cried. I broke down and cried when I heard this news and it took quite a lot to digest it if it can be digested other than in the honoring of it as another very big crack in my broken heart. 
And certainly in the days after that happened, the grieving for those children and teachers, it was a murmuration. It was like grief was floating through the air, the inner space of humanity. The world soul was grieving. Grief is not private. It is a murmuration like starlings in the sky. One more piece before we leave, bewilderment and grief. Many of you know the creative work of the musician Nick Cave, C-A-V-E. He's a prolific songwriter and poet and political activist in his own way, in many ways. And he and his wife had two beautiful boys and they were teenagers when one of his sons, Arthur, was killed. He fell from a cliff near their home in Brighton, England. It was a complete shock, completely unexpected. And he went through a tremendous arc of grief that I'm sure will never leave him. But I'd like to read to you a little bit about what helped him really work the alchemical process of that grieving, the spiritual enzyme of that grief that he went through. He said, for a year, it had been difficult to work out how to write because the center of my life had collapsed. And Susie and I, he and his wife, had been flung to the outer reaches of our lives. We were kind of outlanders floating in deep space, lost in narcissism and self-absorption. And so what was it that turned it around for him? He says, in an artist's case, and perhaps it is the same for everyone, I would say it is a sense of wonder. Creative people in general have a propensity for wonder. Great trauma can rob us of this, the ability to be awed by things. We all needed to draw ourselves back to a state of wonder. And that's what he did. He found his way back to the center of wonder by working and connecting with the community of his friends and his fans. He reclaimed a sense of wonder. I found with some practice, the imagination could propel itself beyond the personal into a state of wonder. In doing so, the color came back to things with a renewed intensity and the world seemed clear and bright, and new. And of course, he says very clearly, he says, that came only with a very profound and deep practice. So, wonder. I would like to pause now and see how you all are doing with all this. Anybody have any comments or question you want to pose or something you'd like to share? I've been recently looking at grieving sadness and whether the grieving, the sadness is a habit, something to not fall into and be stuck in, or if it's a necessary place to be, to move through. And I've kind of been going back and forth with that. So to listen to you this evening helps me recognize and be at peace with being present with it and letting it do its alchemical process. So thank you. It's a lot like working, you know, in meditation, the way I was trained in meditation and the way people are trained in something like Dzogchen, for example, is like you don't force the mind to stop thinking. You just notice it. You just see it. You're aware of it and let it be natural, the flow be natural. And I think this is so true with something like grief that we need to allow it. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Anybody else? I do have a kind of a question or something that I'm, I've been thinking about a lot about something that needs to be different. Can you talk a little bit more about the depths? You were saying the times and the depths. 
Well, the spirit of the depths is the spirit of the deep self. It's the spirit of the origins of our being. So when the spirit of the depths erupts into our conscious mind, our conscious awareness, it may be pushing us in a direction that is not comfortable. Like you were saying, you're aware of something that needs to be different. I mean, my experience is it's something deep in me that wants me to take the next revolution, that wants the next revolution to happen. And that's the spirit of the depths. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. It's like the question that I have is, how have I been posing it to myself? Like, what's the main attraction? What's the next main attraction? I'm looking for the thing that captures my attention. It's there all the time. That that question, like, what will be the next main attraction that will move me from what distracts me now to, to something else? There's lots of ways to talk about the metaphor you're using of the main attraction. Like what is going to draw you forward? What's going to inspire you to keep going? So what's your aim? What is the sense of purpose that you have about life at this point? I know for myself, there's feeling that it's not over yet. I'm not done yet. There's still growth. There's still evolutionary possibility for this one. But so much of what draws that forward more and more is about how can I serve others? How can I make some kind of difference in this world, even if it's just in the presence of being that I bring to how I wash my dishes or how I cook the meal or how I make the phone call? It doesn't have to be some big thing. The practice of presence, of cultivating presence in life, actually, it's, it's really serving. So that that's a main attraction for me. Does that make sense? It does. So you're saying that cultivating presence just in every moment and the things you do is a way to access the depths. Yes. Okay. Yes. And of course, spiritual practices are aimed they're all aimed toward accessing the depths. They're very, very useful. We must do them. We have to do them. And there's a bit of an edge there because the very practice that was perfect for us 10 years ago or 30 years ago is no longer taking us there. It's no longer serving to bring us into deeper connection with ourselves, with those depths. So I say spiritual practice with great honor and appreciation for the practices that I've done, but also as we get older and further along in our forest dwelling as older practitioners, we have to stay fluid. So when you're asking what's the next main attraction, that's a great question. What is the next main attraction? What inspires you right now? What brings the little sense of wonder, what makes your heart open up? And you're like, wow, that's cool. That's a moment of wonder. Doesn't have to be you've been dropped to your knees in a state of awe and you're completely transported. Wonder can be very ordinary. And that's why I feel for me, it's been so important to really take a look at it and acknowledge it and know that it's so much more powerful. Cultivating wonder, you're planting a garden. That's pretty wonderful. The first time you see your marigolds blooming, that can be a moment of wonder, a small thing. But when we have intention, my experience that intention brings that moment of wonder to life and imbues it with a certain kind of power and potential. Seems like if you don't know what the next main attraction is, when I've experienced that, there's been a feeling of being lost. And you said that being willing to get lost is an indication that you're on the right path. But for me, it hasn't felt that way. It's felt anything but. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 
And I think in a period of bewilderment, we are waiting a lot of time. We're just waiting on the spiritual path and in our lives. Waiting is such an essential ingredient of the spiritual path, being able to wait and stay the course. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. And in the waiting, we can be asking. When the time is right, the spirit of the depths will tell us about feeling lost. It doesn't feel like that it's a good thing. Of course, it doesn't feel like a good thing. It's necessary for it to be that intense, for it to have the alchemical effect that it has. You know, this classical medieval text called The Cloud of Unknowing. They don't know who wrote it. It's an anonymous author, some contemplative person. And basically, they're putting out there that this is a real place on the spiritual path. And it's even, for many people, it's an experience of having everything that came before being undone. Like a dark night of the soul. Yes. St. John of the Cross. In retrospect, it's clear that this was necessary alchemically. But in the midst of it, it seems like being lost. Anyway, that's been my experience for periods of time. Yes, me too. Me too. Now I'm talking about it tonight with, you know, some excitement and some enthusiasm, but I haven't always been enthusiastic about it. It's like that moment in the Garden of Gethsemane when Jesus is praying, if it can be, take this cup from me. Or that moment on the cross before he dies when he says, Father, why have you forsaken me? There's something archetypical. There's something in the human experience. that We, we have to go there. We have to have this, the intensity and the power of that experience. We have to be brought to our knees at times. Sometimes that's the only way we will ever kneel and kiss the ground, is if we are brought to our knees. The universe does it. Life does it. Lee used to say, he was the guru, the teacher. He'd say, I don't make lessons for people. I don't do anything. Life does everything. So life is doing everything. And yes, bewilderment and waiting and not knowing, it can go on for a long time. That's how it is ubiquitously in your life. You're lost in the woods. There are those times in our lives where we just have an experience of that for a few months or a few weeks or a few days or a few hours. And then clarity comes back. It seems like often the contradictory is also true. And what I want to say is, what if you're the next main attraction? I want to share this experience we had driving back across the country. We were in a restaurant and this young couple came in, well, young, probably 30s, with their child who was probably 10 months old. And the way that that mother looked at her child, I have never seen anything like that. She had unconditional love and pure adoration for her child. That child would do anything for that mother, basking in that love. And it just struck me that It all starts with us, you know, and if we could, when we can, radiate love, you know, not towards anything in particular, anyone in particular, maybe that is our next main attraction, is acknowledging how powerful our individual love can be. We had this one other experience. We were in a small town after this huge storm went through. And there was no electricity in the town. And we stopped in this one very 1960s motel restaurant. And this young woman was there. And she was run off her feet because the restaurant had a generator. So she was making takeout meals. So I wanted her to show me a room. And then I wanted her to show me another room. And she was so busy. And she had not one ounce of hurry up or 
anything. She was so present and so caring that it just totally blew me away. I don't think she was a practitioner or had a particular path or anything, but she was a kind person who cared about people. And it just brings it back to me. It's what comes through us. So I just wanted to say that. Thank you. And that's very connected to what we were talking about earlier about the power of presence. Because for me, every experience of presence I've had, presence doesn't happen without the heart being involved. And so when you were talking about our love, what the emanations of our love does in the world, I really appreciate that so much. I heard recently that evolutionary biologists, they're actually finding that depression and anxiety, which of course is rampant in the world today and particularly among young people, Depression and anxiety play a key role in helping us in an evolutionary sense because they can help us move beyond those strategies and mindsets, concepts, conceptual ways of thinking and seeing ourselves that are limiting us. So basically, we can grow and get bigger in the sense of the possibility of being a powerful presence in the world that benefits all. I'm convinced that for those of us who are able to feel and are willing to feel deeply everything that life has to offer us, that we have an obligation to feel for everyone because it's that feeling presence, the opening of the heart. It's a balm to the world. It uplifts everyone. Even if we can't see it, we can't measure it, it's mysterious. Because the practice of presence is central to my life, central to the practice of presence for me is the body. And so I just wanted to speak about the body for a moment. Because without attention in the body, I can't be present. So for me, presence is attention embodied in breath and sensation. When attention is embodied in breath and sensation, I am in service. I am available. I am able to take on the suffering of the times without identification. And that energy then can pass through the body and the body can transform it into a finer energy which means simply for me that attention is constantly being refined into a finer and finer substance when I can remain in the body. Oh, that's beautiful. Thank you. That's very connected to what I mean when I say those of us who can feel, we have an obligation to feel because we don't feel with our minds. We feel with our bodies. We feel with the heart, definitely. Feeling is a bodily function. And you mentioned the breath, too. That's so essential. I'm not going to go into that so much tonight in this talk, but the breath, without that, there is no life. So much is possible through paying attention to the breath. The last line of Remy's poem, there are hundreds of ways to kneel and kiss the ground. There are hundreds of ways to kneel and kiss the ground. I was moved by the mother and her adoration of her child and longing for this objective quality of mother, the objective archetype, what mother is. And it brings me to reflect more on what it means to kiss the ground and the kind of longing that we have for mother, for mother earth, for our human mothers, for the divine mother, for the essence of mother. I had this very strong experience some years back. This quality of longing has been with me since I was a very young person. I remember that I even had it as a child, but I first became really aware of it about age 14. My mother married my stepfather. I was 13 years old and My older sister was already 
out of college and married by then. And we had grown up. I had spent the last 10 years of my life living in my grandmother's house with my grandmother and grandfather, my mother and my sister. And it was a, a true sanctuary for me coming out of the divorce that my parents had and the difficulties that we lived through that I don't really remember because I was so young, but they're of course in me, those traumas, those things are in me. So the refuge of my grandmother's house for 10 years growing up and then at 13, 13 and a half, moving to my stepfather's house, my mother's and my stepfather's house. And I began to have these very strong experiences where I was having this deep longing. And the way I expressed that as a young teenager was, I want to go home. And within a few years, I no longer associated that with my grandmother's house. It was something so deep in me that was longing for home. Or we could say the ground as a metaphor, the ground, the mother earth, the ground, the ground of my being, the ground of all being. So back about a year after my teacher Lee died, I went to Scotland for the first time. And I had always wanted to go to Scotland because I have ancestral roots in Scotland, Ireland, and England. And my father had always said to me, before you die, you should go to Scotland. And for years, I sort of said, oh, well, whatever. I wasn't so open to it. But then events conspired for me to go there because quite a number of my friends were moving there, Sangha members and dear friends of mine were moving there. So I went and I had only been there for two days and I've fallen in love with this place. Never had this kind of love, a feeling of coming home, of this was my place in the world. And one of the friends I was traveling with, her niece became very, very ill and she was hovering between life and death in a coma in Phoenix. And of course, my friend said, I have to go home. The family was asking for her to come and be with them. They were in a state of shock. It was a crisis. And my friend said, well, I'm going to just go. It was three o'clock in the morning, in the middle of the night when the news came through and she was on the phone making arrangements for a flight. And I looked at her and I thought to myself, I cannot let her go back by herself. I have to leave and go with her. And so I did, but what I wasn't expecting was that I was thrown into a state of longing and grief, some kind of grief. I couldn't understand what it was, what was happening to me. This feeling of homesickness and yearning and longing, it was way beyond any kind of nostalgia or sentimentality. It didn't have anything to do with that. It was something much, much deeper. It was the spirit of the depths talking to me and pulling me. We left. Really, it was heartbreaking to leave that place, Scotland. And so it all worked out. And I've been there four or five times since then. And I love Scotland. But what I discovered was that in Gaelic, they have a word for this feeling of homesickness. That's not a sentimental or nostalgic state. That's something so much deeper. And it's called kianalas, and it translates as longing. It's very beautiful because longing is something that can open the doors of wonder. It's very connected to our bewilderment and our grief. My experiences of grief have been deeply threaded with longing. Longing for that which does not pass when you're in the throes of loss and grief, longing for that which endures. So Kiana loss. And I recently stumbled across in a very synchronistic sort of way, someone talking about their experience of leaving Scotland in exactly the same terms of what I felt. And that's when I discovered this word Kiana loss. The Welsh have a similar word, he wraith means the same thing. It's about this objective state of longing. For me, kneeling and kissing the ground, it's both this longing and it's also gratitude. It's longing for the origins of the self, the great self. 
I want to tell a story to end that has to do with the hundreds of ways to kneel against the ground. And the story, it's an ancient myth from Egypt. It's thousands of years old. So thousands of years ago, maybe 4,000 years ago or more, 5,000 years ago, the sun god, Ra, he was the sun, of course. So he's uh, very, very uh, vitally important to all of life. And he, for some reason, gods do these things. He had come down to earth and he was hanging out on the streets just being a dirty beggar and people were not honoring him or recognizing him even and they would walk past him and spit on him but it was actually raw they would spit on him or they would kick dust in his face it wasn't working for raw he went back to the heaven realms and he decided that he would talk to his wife Hathor, who was also his daughter, who was also his sister, because that's how myths are. They don't adhere to any of our norms that we have in the world. So he goes to Hathor and he's lamenting what's going on on earth, that the people are not worshiping and honoring the divine that's inherent in life. The very divine, we don't even recognize it. It's right there on the street corner, looking like a dirty beggar or looking like a homeless person or looking like any other aspect of nature, not recognizing the divinity and the beauty and the sanctity in the world. And so Hathor says, well, I will handle this. And Ra says, yes, please do. This is your job. You set those people straight. So Hathor then comes down to the earth and she gets very wrathful and she starts drinking blood because that's what goddesses do. Kali does the exact same thing in India, in the Indian myth of Kali. When she's killing demons, she gets so ecstatic about restoring righteousness and dharma and truth, restoring things to the way they should be that uh, she just starts going on a rampage and all of the gods get worried. The gods don't know what to do. Kali, she's gone so wild killing demons and drinking their blood that she's now going to destroy all of life, not just set things straight and kill the demons, but destroy all of life. And so Shiva says, "Uh, I'll take care of it. And he goes and he lays down, he sees the path as she's moving across the landscape and he sees exactly where he needs to lie down. He lies down in front of her. And as soon as she puts her foot on his chest, she goes into bliss and ecstasy. So that's how they handle it in India, in the myth. In Egypt, Hathor is doing the same thing because it's this one of the things that the goddess, Prakriti, the divine mother does when things get out of control. So in Egypt, what happens is that Ra starts watching. He sees Hathor has gone mad and she's gone way too far, and he doesn't want her to kill all of humanity. And so he decides that what he'll do is he will take this emmer beer that they made in ancient Egypt and Sumeria, and he will put some berries in it and some things to make it look like blood. And she drinks the emmer beer. They offer it to her. It's a libation for Hathor. And she drinks the libation, and it soothes her and she calms, and she relaxes, and then Ra is able to bring her back to the heaven realm, and equilibrium is restored. Everything becomes harmonious again, finally. It takes a long time for that to happen. So the reason why this particular myth is important in Africa and Egypt, amongst indigenous people, including the Yoruba people, from what I've understood, is this concept of libation. So as I was listening to Bayo Okomalafe speaking about this process of giving libations, he said that all the time he was growing up, that whenever his father or his uncle or his mother, any of them, they were going to have a glass of wine or a cup of beer, they would always pour a little bit on the ground for Hathor. So what's the meaning of the metaphor of this? The meaning of the metaphor is this is one of the ways that we kneel and kiss the ground 
that our very attention and presence is a libation. Our awareness cultivated is a libation to the mother, to that which we long for, to the divine mother, to the divinity that is embedded throughout nature. So how do we make our libations? Wonder and our awe is actually a libation. We allow ourselves to be transported in wonder for a little brief second by the opening of a rose, by the smile on a child's face, and the smile on the mother's face. It was a moment of wonder for her. It's a libation. And the more we can be conscious of it and be aware of it, the more empowered that libation becomes. The more presence we bring to it, the more powerful it is. Gratitude is another, that's a libation that is a a very precious substance. So I'd like to end with a couple of things. Prayers and our praise, all forms of prayer and praise, it's all libation, it's all an offering. Annie Lamont says there are three types of prayer. I think she started with just two, thank you and help me. And then she added, wow. Thank you, help me, wow. I love that. That's contemporary shorthand. I'm going to end with a couple of poems. These are from Mary Oliver. One of them is an excerpt. It's a fragment from a poem about the life of the imagination, which has everything to do with wonder. Sometimes the great bones of my life feel so heavy, and all the tricks my body knows, the opposable thumbs, the kneecaps, and the mind clicking and clicking, don't seem enough to carry me through this world. And I think how I would like to have wings, blue ones ribbons of flame. And another one from Mary Oliver. To live in this world, you must be able to do three things. To love what is mortal, to hold it against your bones, knowing your own life depends upon it. And when the time comes, to let it go. Thank you so much for your presence. This is Vimy. Today, like every other day, we wake up empty and frightened. Don't open the door to the study and begin reading. Take down a musical instrument. Let the beauty we love be what we do. There are hundreds of ways to kneel and kiss the ground.